Several months ago here at El Camino Baptist Church, we uh, celebrated Veterans Day. Do you remember that? And uh, a PowerPoint played on these screens here, and I was rather surprised. It, it honored the uh, men and women who served and or are serving in our armed forces. And I couldn't believe how long that went on. I'd never seen that before. I mean, I'd seen churches where there were many veterans, but I had never seen so many in one church. And I, I, I realized I was in a pretty uh, a stunning place. I'm in a room right now that has of some really battle-tested uh, heroes. In fact, we lost one this week. When I heard that Phil Schultz had died, I, I thought, he was sitting behind me last Sunday singing. I heard him sing. I stopped several times because I wanted to listen to him sing. He sang beautifully, 97 years old. I couldn't believe it. Well, I guess now he has perfect pitch. So uh, that, that's, that's wonderful. But when I saw that, that video, that presentation of all the veterans in this church, it reminded me of the sad reality that, that we are a, a world at war. We're, we're, we've been fighting wars for all of human history. Right now we're fighting wars over in, in, in the Middle East. Uh, the Cold War seems to be uh, heating up again. Guerrilla warfare is uh, ubiquitous all over the planet. Terrorism takes place in country after country. We're a world at war. In addition to the, these wars fought with weapons, we have uh, culture conflicts, and we have wars of words, and we have political conflicts. People are fighting everywhere. But the worst war of all is one we don't talk about that much, and that's the spiritual warfare that goes on behind the scenes. It is by far the most uh, potent of all the wars. It has a lot more people who die as a result of this war. And the death is not just temporal, it's eternal. And today we're going to encounter the last passage through our long study of the epistle of Ephesians. And the Apostle Paul is going to end his great epistle to this church in one of the most important cities of the world when he lived, Ephesus. He's going to end it by telling the people that you're at war, and this war is raging, and you need to be equipped to fight this war, and do not be afraid, because this war has been won and is winnable. And so today, we're going to turn to a passage on war. Now, spiritual war is something that the Ephesian people knew about. If you want to know about what happened in Ephesians when Paul came there, you have to go back to the book of Acts. And it tells us the story that when Paul came into the city of, of Ephesus and started speaking about this Jesus, this Jewish person who was declared to be the Messiah was crucified by his own people and the Roman government and then rose from the dead. This was quite a stunning development. And then great miracles were taking place and thousands and thousands of people were being converted to Christianity. And so there were some, some Jewish people who, who didn't know Christ and saw that Paul had all this great power and they said, well, let's us try to do the same thing. And they did try. And they ended up getting jumped, overpowered, beaten up, and stripped naked by the demons. And there were others in the town of Ephesus and they who, who formerly had practiced sorcery because Ephesus was a centerpiece of sorcery, they came to Christ and they threw away their sorcery and they burned their occult equipment. In today's dollars, something like $4 million worth. That's a lot. So this town of Ephesus knew about spiritual warfare. They had, with their own eyes, seen it. And now in this last passage, the Apostle Paul is going to address this very, very important subject. Here's a quote from um, a, a, a commentator that I have used many times throughout the last several weeks. He said this, Throughout history, nearly all cultures that have ever existed, all cultures have believed in the demonic. And apart from the Western world, they still do. But just when we thought belief in demons would go away, 
it has come back with force. We almost need the dynamic, demonic to explain the extent of evil in the world. It's almost like, you, how do you account for all the evil things, including what we just saw on the screen? How do you account for this? In a culture all over the world where the life of the most innocent of the innocent is considered not human. How do you account for this? Widespread, intelligent, good people. How do you account for this? It's almost like there is something beyond us spiritually going on. We are a world at war. Sooner or later, if you're a believer, you're going to have to come to grips with the fact that um, you're not a civilian. And you face a, a, a battle that, that, that rages all around us that we oftentimes don't see. And it's a spiritual war. And so the Apostle Paul is going to talk about fighting the spiritual battle. And before I go there, throughout the Scriptures, you'll find that the Bible says there are basically three enemies that we face. They're called the, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Many times we like to think that the devil is the only source of evil. That is not true, and I don't believe he's the strongest force either. The world is, is, is the world system. The whole system of, of cultures all around the world are basically opposed to God. They cater to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. The world system reinforces people placing their ultimate love in things, in pleasures, and in their ego. And that's easy to see in America. We specialize in it. That's the world. The flesh is me. Un, this is unique to Christianity. No other world religion, to my knowledge, believes this. We believe in that human nature is sinful. That doesn't mean we don't do good things. All people do some good things. But at heart, we are. there's no one who's righteous. No, not even one. There's no one who seeks God. That's what the Bible says. There's no one. We are not innately good. And so, because of who we are, our flesh, our nature, constantly fights against what is righteous, what is good, what is holy. And obviously, the devil plays a big part, and we'll see more about him today. But, lest you get the wrong perspective, at the cross, the greatest battle that the world has ever seen took place. We might think that Armageddon is the greatest battle still to come, but I don't believe that's probably true. The greatest battle that has ever been fought was fought 2,000 years ago when good and evil were faced in the darkest and most vicious that could ever be, when God himself submitted himself to death and died on a cross and then rose triumphantly from the grave. That was victory. So Warren Wiersbe says, as Christians, we do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. Don't forget, the victory has been won. These are the mopping up operations. A number of years ago, many years ago, when I was in high school, I played football. And my, I was a quarterback. In my senior year, we had a very good team. And uh, we defeated our foes. We were undefeated. We defeated our foes by many points. But there was one foe in particular, Northwestern Military Academy, that we played against. And um, we were creaming them. We were ahead by 40 points at the end of the first half. And uh, I mean, it, it was impossible for them to beat us. I mean, we could have just, just rolled on the ground and we would have uh, defeated them. And you might think that since they knew that they couldn't possibly defeat us, they, they would just kind of roll over and get the game over with. They did not. I don't know what their coach told them at halftime, but I think he probably told them, guys, we can't possibly win this game, but we can exact a price. Play dirty. And so they did. We'd get tackled and they would um, do things to us grab us, scratch us, bite us. They did all kinds of things. And eventually, we fought back. And the stands cleared. I know my father came out and tried to stop the fighting from the stands. And some one of the persons on the opposite team took off his helmet and hit my dad over the head with his, with his helmet. And that reminded me, that's what Satan has done. You see, Northwestern Military Academy could not beat us. It was impossible. We were ahead by 42 points. 
But that doesn't mean you roll over and play dead. They now decided they will play dirty. That's Satan. At the cross 2,000 years ago, Satan was defeated. He cannot possibly win. But that doesn't mean he's going to roll over and play dead. Now he plays dirty, really dirty. And who's his main foe? I'm looking at you, us. Not the people of our world that he already has under his dominion. He's the prince of the power of the air. It's us. And so we're the pawns, or we're the ones that he most attacks. We're the, 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 the targets of his guerrilla warfare. Paul knew this because Paul was a big target. In fact, it seems that Paul was attacked not by the demons, but by Satan himself. But he stood strong. And he now teaches us how to do the same. And he asked us now to, as Christians, be armed. To be armed and dangerous. And here's our text of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 24. Now, if you remember from uh, many months ago in September, we began in, the first, uh, in September with talking about the first chapter of the book of Ephesians. And the book, the book begins in the heavenlies. But now the book is going to end in the trenches. He begins with talking about who we are in Christ and all the blessings that we have received as Christians from the heavenlies. But now he's going to bring us right down to earth and tell us that we're involved in a trench warfare. And last week, he, he, he left off with how to have a little bit of heaven in your home, how to have a, a, a relation, have, uh, live in a home where the husbands and the wives love and respect one another, and parents and children work together beautifully, and, and, and slaves and masters, even in that society, cared for one another. How do you, how do you get that? Well, in Christ. But now, he's going to take us from this tranquility to a place of warfare. And here's what he says, finally. Finally means he's at the end of his epistle, finally. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now when you read those words, you think, oh, big deal. But there is a big deal because the tense of these words is extremely important. First of all, they're in the present tense. That means this strength we must constantly, constantly utilize. But it says, be strong. It doesn't say, finally, get out there and fight. He said, no, no, be strong. That's the passive form, which means that there's some, there's a, the empowerment that we need is not something we do. It's the empowerment that is done to us. You see, the Bible is clear. We have no ability in and of ourselves to fight the spiritual warfare to fight it, fight it successfully. We don't have that ability. We do not have that strength. None of us do. But God didn't say, get out there and fight the spiritual battle. He says, no, be strong in the Lord. Hot when? All the time. This empowerment must be continual. You see, we do not have in and of ourselves adequate power to fight the spiritual battle. But in God, that power is invincible. Now, evil doesn't look evil. And in fact, evil even has some pleasant consequences for a short time. It's, it's sweet to some degree. But you see, we're called to put on the full armor of God because Satan is a schemer. He does things that are, um, are underhanded, manipulative. Obviously, you know he uses temptation. You see, our own strength will not cut it in battle. Take Solomon. Solomon was, one of, the, was the, one of the wisest people who ever lived. And, but his mental strength was no match for the lure of foreign women. No match. Samson was among the strongest physical specimens the world has ever seen. But he was no match for the wiles of Delilah. And David, David was one of the most spiritually sensitive human beings who has ever lived. But his spiritual strength was no match for his lust for Bathsheba. No match. 
You see, we do not have, no matter how smart you are, no matter how spiritual you are, no matter how strong you are, we do not have in and of ourselves the ability to fight the spiritual battle ourselves. So we need help. We need the armor of God. Now, the, the devil, the foe we stand against, his major goal is to get back at God. That's his goal. goal. His strategic target is us, Christians. His major methods are deception and temptation and accusation. The Bible calls him an accuser of the brethren. He's called a murderer and a liar. He's called a roaring lion that seeks to devour people. He's called the God of this age who blinds people's eyes. His power is massive, but it is limited. And though he was defeated, uh, defeated decisively on the cross, his defeat only redoubled his maleficence. He is angrier than ever. By the way, if one of Satan's schemes is to try to trick us, that he's a joke. We'll talk about that a bit later. And so dabbling in things like uh, Ouija boards and horoscopes and these kinds of things is just kind of cute and fun. It is not. It is not. It is something you should studiously stay away from. These are not little funny things. They're, they're bad. But then the Apostle Paul, after having introduced the war, he's going to give a proviso. He says in the next verses, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You see, one of the things that we often do is we try to find human people who are responsible for the evils in this world, and we, we lash out at them. And he says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. That is not our struggle. Our struggle is not against other people, but against rulers of powers, against world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in high or, high or heavenly places. Now, many people from this verse try to recreate this enormous hierarchy of evil beings that rule in the netherworld that we cannot see. Though some people believe that, I think it's rubbish, personally. And I think most commentators say these are just, these are just words. It's not talking about various hierarchies of evil that exist, but simply by using word after word to describe, trying to increase the rhetorical effect to realize how evil are the forces we deal with. But not that there's some hierarchy and, and all of these uh, uh, demons behind every, um, every bush or rock that you see. But to be successful in, in battle, you, you have to know your enemy. You have to know who your enemy is. That's one of the reasons why we were so unsuccessful in the Vietnam War was we did not know who our enemy was. It's the same thing in the Gulf Wars today that our, our, our precious soldiers over there, they don't know where the, the terror is coming from, uh, under the roads or somebody dressed, uh, a, a, a woman, a child. It used to be when soldiers wore different colored uniforms. You knew who they were, but that's not the way wars are fought anymore. It's all stealth. And that's the method of, of, of Satan. And... Uh, and then it says, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Now, interestingly, this word stand is going to come up uh, in various forms five times in this little passage. And that should remind us of something. Remember, we said that this warfare is not something that we go into actively, but this is a war that it has to be fought by God and we are with him. So this is a war in which our responsibility is not offensive, it's defensive. We stand. I sometimes see on the television, and, and it just drives me crazy, and it really hurts me. Here's some Christian preacher saying, now let's get up and let's go get the devil. I say, ooh, don't do that. You can't, first of all, you, the, the, there's only one devil, and he's not messing around in Tucson, I suspect, right now. But you think you can go out and fight the devil. You are very mistaken. And besides, God didn't say that. What he says to us is either stand or run. 
the opposite way. That's what the Bible says. We don't go after Satan. We stand against him because he's already defeated or we flee. We run away. You don't go on the offensive. It's like children's soccer. It's fun to watch little children. I have many grandchildren and watch them play soccer. And, you know, everyone wants to be where the ball is. They, they, they don't. And maybe that's why the rest of the world uh, plays soccer and we play football. We love big scores, but the rest of the world knows that the real game, soccer, is all about defense. And, and do you hear it? And we're going to hear it over the next few weeks with football. Championships are won by defense. Defense. And I would say the spiritual war is won by defense. It's about arming yourself with our comrades arm in arm and standing firm because the battle has been won already by Jesus Christ. So we stand firm in what he has done for us. Um, one of the most famous books or, or treatises written about war um, was, was written by a man named uh, uh, Sun Tzu in, in the 500s B.C. And he said, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know your enemy and you know yourself, do you see what the passage has done so far for us? It says, first of all, you must know yourself. You cannot win this battle. You can't do it. You will lose every time. You do not have the spiritual strength to win a, a spiritual battle. And this battle is fought against a very wily enemy whose wiles are very well documented in the Bible and in our own lives. And so we need to be people who know ourselves and know our enemy. And if you know yourself and you know your enemy, what will you do? You'll arm yourself with the armor that God has supplied for us. Now, interestingly, the Apostle Paul, when he writes this, we know is in prison. And it's possible that he is in prison chained to a Roman soldier. And so, as he's chained to a Roman soldier, he's got there the guy, maybe he's hanging on his leg and sitting on a chair, and he's writing. Well, the guy's got a helmet on. And by the way, the Apostle Paul not only knew what a Roman soldier was because he was perhaps chained to one, he also knew his Old Testament scriptures incredibly well. He was trained as a rabbi. And so he's going to now derive from the book of Isaiah every piece of the armor of the Roman soldier to, have, to whom he's perhaps attached and apply that to us in the spiritual battle. All from the book of Isaiah. Here's how it goes. There's the armor. A typical Roman soldier would have been armed uh, by in the pictures that you see there. And he's going to start with the belt. He says, stand firm. Remember, there's our word stand again. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. It was like a leather uh, apron covering um, one's waist, protecting the lower abdomen, and uh, if there was any kind of a, a, um, a, a, a skirt that they would wear to, that would impede their, their movement, they would tie it up and put it under this, this leather girdle. Now, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, it says this. Righteousness, it's speaking about the Messiah. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness, the sash around his waist. That's what it says. That's what the Messiah will be. He will... He will wear a belt of righteousness and faithfulness. And so he begins with, stand firm, having girded your loins with truth. And then he looks and he sees the breastplate. The breastplate was made of metal plates that covered both the front and the back of the soldier from the neck to the waist. And it protected, obviously, the, the vital organs, the lungs, the heart, and the lower digest digestive tract. And here's Isaiah 59, verse 17. He... This is the Lord. This is the Messiah. He, the Lord, will put on righteousness as his breastplate. Do you see what Paul is doing? Paul is drawing from his knowledge of the Old Testament and his knowledge of the Roman soldier, perhaps to whom he's attached, 
And he puts those together. He said, now also, if you're going to guard your heart, you must guard your heart with putting on a breastplate of righteousness. And your feet. The Roman soldiers on their feet wore, wore boots that had open toes, and yet they had like little metal spikes, like football spikes that we used to wear, so you could grip the turf. Remember, their job was not so much to advance, their job was to hold their ground. So he says, put, put on your feet the gospel of peace. And this is from Isaiah. This is Isaiah chapter 52. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So as he looks at the, at the shoes of the Roman soldier, he says, ah, I, that reminds me from the book of Isaiah of feet that are fit with the gospel of peace. And then he turns to the shield. The shield was big, four feet by two and a half feet. It was, um, had some wood portion to it, but it was covered with leather, and the leather was often um, put in water so what, when darts came in it that were flaming, they would be extinguished because the leather was very, very wet. And these shields were sometimes put in front of them so that they could stand in a long line and be protected against arrows coming at them. And um, once again, you find the Apostle Paul drawing his metaphor from both the Roman soldier and from the Old Testament. And last, the helmet of salvation. And this is Isaiah 59, 17. He, the Messiah, put on the helmet of salvation on his head. You see how he's drawing them directly from the Old Testament. And the Roman soldier's helmet, obviously guarding the brain, was made of metal, but it was not only protective, it was also decorative. It was had like sometimes big plumes on the top of them. And then last, the sword of the Spirit. Now this picture is not quite correct because that is not what it really looked like for a Roman soldier. The Roman soldier's sword that he speaks of is a little sword carried on the belt that was used for hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so the word that Paul uses here is of the little sword, not this big sword. But the sword, and he, he makes that is, that's the, the, the word of God. Now, you might say, oh, nice, isn't that cute? Isaiah, Roman soldiers, so what? What does that have to do with us? Well, the first thing I would say is that this armor that the Apostle Paul is drawing on from the book of Isaiah all speaks of the coming Messiah. And now the Apostle Paul knows who that Messiah is. And who is that Messiah? He is the truth. He is righteousness personified. He is the gospel of peace. He is faithful and true. He is our salvation. And he is the word of God. So the Apostle Paul is speaking clearly that the armor is Jesus. That's who our armor is. Remember, he says, you cannot fight the spiritual battle on your own. And that's why the theme of this whole series has been us in him, in us. We fight in him. And who is the in him? Obviously, Jesus. One of the articles that has had a big impact on me um, is, is written by a man named Do uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, perhaps you know from uh, the last century. He wrote an article that uh, 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 it's called, it's a book actually, I think, it's called Spiritual Depression. And in that book on spiritual depression, he says this. We, uh, I'm going to read, read it to, to you. Um, the main trouble in this whole matter of spiritual depression is in a sense this, that we allow ourselves to talk to us instead of talking to ourselves. Am I just trying to be deliberately paradoxical? Far from it. This is the very essence of wisdom. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness, and I would say also impotency, spiritual impotency, have you realized that most of your spiritual unhappiness is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Do you ever listen to yourself? You messed up again. You're an idiot. You'll never get this one right. 
You fall into that same habit a hundred times, you think you're ever going to change, you're worthless. You're an idiot. You're a spiritual nothing. How many times do our, do, does our self-talk tell us things that are true? Not often. Or on the other side, hey, you're the greatest that ever lived. You're just a slight bit less than perfect. There's, you're, you've got basically good. Every, I mean, both are lies. If we listen to ourselves, not only will we be unhappy, we will lose the spiritual battle. The key to winning the spiritual battle is learning to talk to ourselves, not listen to ourselves. We need to, first of all, tell ourselves the truth, the belt of truth. Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. You see, a big reason we lose the spiritual battle is because we don't tell ourselves the truth. We rationalize, we shift responsibility, we blame shift. The first way to win the spiritual battle is to tell yourself the truth. Then you guard your heart with what? The imputed righteousness of Christ. How often when you fight a battle and, and you've lost the spiritual battle, do you say, oh, I'm worthless. I, God will, God's not going to like me. I don't know if I'm even a Christian anymore. But wait a minute. My righteousness has not been earned. My righteousness has been imputed by the Lord Jesus Christ based on faith, not my good deeds. Guard your heart with the righteousness of Christ and then speak the gospel of peace to your troubled soul. Your failing soul, your soul that's failed again. And then focus on the promises of our faithful God. Oh, many times when I struggle with anxiety, I say, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your requests may be made known unto God, and the God of all peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Over and over again, I'll repeat that. I'm talking to myself. Now, we, thankfully, we live in a world everywhere you go today, people are talking to themselves. It, well, it looks like it. They're actually talking on their cell phone. But they look like they're, we ought to be talking to ourselves all the time. Telling ourselves what is true, not what is false. Fill your head with the glory of God's salvation and soak yourself in the Scriptures. Why? Because the key to the spiritual battle is clothing ourselves in Christ and talking to ourselves about what is true in Christ. But if you listen to yourself, you will likely be terribly defeated. So that's what he says. Well, you see, probably Paul knows that probably the most important facet of fighting a war is communication. You, we, we have to keep in constant communication with our commanding officer and with our comrades. And so here's what he says next. He says uh, this with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. He likes all. Four alls there. When to do it. If you go back one more time, just to that previous slide, Linda, if you wouldn't mind. It says, um, what, what do you do? All prayer. When? All times. Um, with all perseverance. For whom? For all the saints. That's our communication, which we could spend a lot of time on. Someone, uh, Robert Law, said, well, prayer is not getting man's will done in heaven. It is getting God's will done on earth. And so he goes on and he says, and pray for me that utterance may be given me to opening, for the opening of my mouth to make known the, with boldness the mystery of the gospel and then he says, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And then he ends with his comrades in arms. Paul ends his epistles as usual with the naming and the blessing of his comrades. And he says, I'm not in this alone. And he's going to mention the one, his friend Tychicus, who's probably the one who carries this message. It's like a courier in war. So the next passage is this. He says, but that you also may know about my circumstances, how I am doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make everything known to you. So he's, this is the one who's carrying the war message back to the people of Ephesus. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know about us and that he may comfort your hearts. And then 
he has a benediction. Peace. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. Well, we've come to the end of Ephesians and let me just summarize briefly a few things about spiritual warfare. Number one, spiritual warfare is real. I wish it wasn't, but it is. We must not live like we're civilians. If you live like a civilian in wartime, something's wrong with you and uh, there's a war going on. Um, we're being stalked. We're the targets, uh, targets of nefarious criminals. We are the prime candidates for the evil designs of a massive and mega-powerful terrorist organization. That's the truth. We are right now. And uh, perhaps the greatest, uh, um, the greatest deceit of Satan of all is to convince Christians that we're basically civilians. Our job here is to live a really nice life, have all the creature comforts we can get. We got we're entitled to rights and freedoms, and we're allowed to come and go and do and don't do as we wish. And uh, there's some of that that's true, but the truth is there's a war raging, and we're the primary targets in this war. And so we must arm ourselves. Secondly, spiritual warfare must not be feared, nor focused on extensively. This is C.S. Lewis in the Screw Tape Letters. He said, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence. And the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. And I think that is true. And we happen to live in, in, a, in, a, in our secular world, they diminish the reality of Satan. In our world, the Christian world, I think we're overemphasizing it. Here are the facts. These are the facts. The Old Testament hardly treats this subject at all. In the Old Testament, Satan is mentioned only on three occasions. Evil is real, but the demonic gets small billing. It's there, but it's not a prominent subject. Paul speaks of demons only at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 1 Timothy chapter 4. So he does not make a big point of it either. As a result of what's called the third wave of the Spirit, many are focusing more frequently on the devil, demon possession and exorcism, territorial spirits, and the issue of blinding demons, um, or, or binding demons, by the way. I think our danger today is we're overemphasizing it. What we should be overemphasizing is Christ, the armor of God. And um, so we don't focus over it. This is um, Walter Rink. Walter Rink says the discussion of demons is vastly overbilled and over-individualized. So don't, don't fall into either error. The error of our society that underestimates the power of the spiritual world or the other error which overemphasizes it. Our focus should not be on the demonic. Our focus should be on Jesus, on the victory, not the, the one that's uh, defeated. Third, beware of blame shifting our sin to the devil. The devil made me do it. No, Flipper Wilson is not right. No, the devil did not make you do it. You did it. What, what we sometimes use the devil as an excuse for taking responsibility for our own sin. That is not right. It is not good. It is not healthy. But we must know who our enemy is and isn't. Our enemy is the evil one. Our enemy is the world system. Our enemy is our flesh. But the enemy is not other people. So um, other people may be pawns of the devil, but they are not the enemy. Persons, places, and things are not the enemy. It was Jesus himself who taught us that there's nothing outside of a person that can defile you. We don't need to live in fear at all. And our main spiritual defense is to arm ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the reason for this series, Us in Him, in Us. Well, I end with this great man, Martin Luther who at, um, at, a high, at a very uh, tough point in his life where he could well have been killed, he
he gave those famous words, though some doubt that it's actually historically accurate. He said these, Unless I am convinced by proofs from Scripture or by plain and clear reasons and arguments, I cannot and will not retract, for it is neither safe nor wise to do anything against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. And so with Martin Luther, who wrote that great, great hymn about the victory in the spiritual warfare, could we now stand as we together sing his song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. 